Hi, it's Megan. Before we get to the episode, I want to tell you about the latest development for my project, The Unspeakeasy. It's called The Unspeakeasy School of Thought. As you probably know, The Unspeakeasy's flagship offerings are in-person retreats and an online community for women. Those aren't going anywhere. But beginning in April, we will be offering courses for everyone with an emphasis on intellectual curiosity, artistry over identity, humor, and of course, nuance. We're kicking things off with three writing courses, a fiction workshop taught by novelist Chaley Widger, a screenwriting workshop taught by Hollywood veteran Sam Wolfson, and, are you ready for this? A workshop in something I just declared a new genre, writing your cancellation story. That's right. After having a number of students show up in my own workshops, wrestling with how to tell stories of social or professional exile in the most effective way possible, I thought that there should be a whole class in this subject. And now there is. Best of all, it is being taught by legendary author Sherman Alexie. Sherman's classic novel, The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian, has sold millions of copies worldwide and is taught in thousands of classrooms every year. He also knows a thing or two about being canceled. This is an incredible opportunity to study with amazing teachers. So if you're interested, go to theunspeakeasy.com, pull down the School of Thought menu, and find out how to apply. Classes begin the week of April 15th. They take place on Zoom, and the application deadline is April 1st. We'd love to hear from you. All these so-called progressive writers have become incredibly reactionary and group thought. And now I'm wondering if maybe there's all these 13, 14, and 15-year-olds who are going to become writers who utterly rebel against what's happening now. Will they rise up and take back the small press world and they take back publishing and they rebel against the MFA and they rebel against AWP and they rebel against all the literary mafias out there. And, you know, maybe there is a Sylvia Plath or Dorothy Parker or Toni Morrison or or somebody genuinely revolutionary is on the way. Maybe there's four of them and they'll change everything. Welcome to the Unspeakable Podcast. I'm your host, Megan Dom. My guest is author Sherman Alexie. If you were in middle school or high school in the last couple of decades, there's a good chance you were assigned Sherman's classic young adult novel, The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian. It's an epistolary novel, with cartoon illustrations even, about a native teenage boy growing up on the Spokane Indian Reservation. The book is semi-autobiographical. Sherman grew up on that reservation in the 1970s and 80s and is a member of the Spokane tribe. He is also arguably or maybe inarguably, the most significant Native American writer of the last 30 years. Not only did The Absolutely True Diary win the 2007 U.S. National Book Award for Young People's Literature, as well as other prizes, his 1993 story collection, The Lone Ranger and Tonto Fistfight in Heaven, was adapted into the film Smoke Signals, for which Sherman wrote the screenplay, and which was a commercial success as well as hugely culturally significant, for reasons we'll discuss. If this is the first time you're hearing about Sherman, or if you're realizing you haven't heard from him in a while, it's because in 2018, he underwent a cancellation event that resulted in something resembling total career annihilation seemingly overnight. We won't get into the details of the event itself, Though I will say that after looking into it, it seems to have been driven largely by rumor and innuendo. But we will talk about the aftermath, including his and my feelings about the current state of the literary world and why I asked him to teach a class for me. As you may have heard me announce, and as I'll explain a little more, my project, The Unspeakeasy, which until now has focused on a private online community and so-called free speech vacation retreats for women is now offering classes for everyone taught on Zoom. It's called the Unspeakeasy School of Thought. Sherman is teaching a workshop in writing your cancellation story, a new genre, which I have declared a genre. And at the end of this conversation, you'll hear him explain what that's going to be like. I'm making this interview available for everyone, not just paid subscribers. So here it is. Sherman Alexi. 
Welcome to The Unspeakable. Thank you for having me, Megan. We have so many things to talk about. Your literary career, your thoughts about the current state of American culture, kind of curious also about your thoughts about Native Americans and the whole BIPOC scheme of things. There's also the fact that you'll be teaching for me a class about cancellation, which I have uh, declared a genre in and of itself, writing about one's cancellation. But since you um, and I, to some extent, less famously than you, but still very much so, since you and I were once part of the so-called literary world, I thought we would start by talking about a recent eruption in that world concerning the literary magazine Guernica. Would you be game for that? Yes, I would. Okay. Guernica Gate, as we'll call I it. I think they had published me at some point way back when. <laughs> Well, you know what? They, I don't know if I should be saying this on the air. I'm pretty sure that they were going to publish me and then change their mind like four hours later. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's a familiar story. We can talk about that later as well. Yeah, and that was a while ago. So like way, you know, 2017 or something. So anyway, okay. So I mean, if, in case the listeners don't know, Guernica is, it's not exactly a household name, but it's a literary journal it's known for, you know, it's they do art and poetry and photography, I believe. And, you know, they do a lot of, you know, progressive politics is very much the sensibility. But they're, you know, a journal of, of literature. And something happened, we're recording this on March 16th, so something happened in the last week or two where they had published an essay by a, a British-born Israeli woman living in Israel that talked about sort of threading the needle of empathy in the wake of the war there. And we can go into some of the details in, in a minute here. But but suffice it to say that after this was published, it did not land well with the staff of the journal and also people on Twitter. So I'll just stop talking there and maybe you can pick up from there and tell us kind of where you came in on this saga. I'm not really part of the book world anymore, so I don't immediately hear about these things. And my writer friends don't really participate in any of it. So I sort of live on an island that has toll bridges to other people who live on islands. And all of us are very separate from the mainland of progressive book world. So I have to be told about these things. So I read the essay, the personal essay, and I thought it was really good. I thought it walked an incredibly difficult line of empathy for everybody involved. I mean, that's what that's its greatest crime in the view of a lot of people on the left is she wrote with negative capability. You know, John Keats talking about <laughs> the ability to deal with opposing ideas. Scott Fitzgerald wrote about that, that the sign of a superior intelligence is the ability to hold two opposing ideas at the same time. And that's what she did. The idea that, yes, I can have empathy for Palestinians, I can have empathy for Jewish people, and somewhere in there, <laughs> there's some place where she could place herself morally that felt moral to her, that she didn't need to write in extremes or believe in extremes. And I thought it was brave to do that, which seems like a crazy thing to laud a writer for approaching a subject with empathy. Right, and that that would be brave. So we should say that the name of the essay is From the Edges of a Broken World. The author is Joanna Chen, she works as a translator of Hebrew and Arabic literature, poetry and prose, I believe. And okay, so what you just described is pretty much like how I always was taught is the point of writing anything. Uh, like it's pretty basic that you should like try to have a, a kind of sophisticated view on things and work with complexity and entertain complexity and try to do something new and surprising. But that is now considered brave and even transgressive. And uh, in fact, um, we can talk about the some of the outcry, but the short version of this is that the magazine retracted the piece. They, they pulled it down 
and then sort of fell all over themselves apologizing for the harm that it had caused. Yeah, and this, that yeah, that's the thing that really gets me is they accepted it. They published it. They knew it was great. And then they let the mob <laughs> uh, decide for them. I mean, they insulted themselves. They downgraded their own intelligence and aesthetic. They, the diminishment of their own literary taste. And uh, it's, it's shocking to me. And I don't know who these editors are. They're all young people. I have no clue. Uh, I mean, they were in diapers when I started. So I just started thinking of the old-time editors I used to work with at the magazines who would publish what they loved. And to think that they would turn their back on something they loved, they're cowards. (laughs) I have no problem calling them that. They're cowards. In fact, I think less of them for retracting it than I do of the people who were offended by it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, just to give people a taste, and I wrote a a substack about this if people want to go look look at that. I'll link to it. But just, you know, we had tweets like, shame on you. Please understand that this is somebody on X addressing the magazine. Shame on you. Please understand that you are indeed a colonizing racist. I encourage you to hang on to this feeling and never let it go. Oh, this is somebody who's actually responding to a tweet that was taken down or includes potentially sensitive content. I find open warmongering less nauseating than this sort of faux self-pitying, than this sort of self-pitying, faux-bleeding heart claptrap. The fascist propaganda is at least honest. The liberal propagandist never shuts up about how tormented they are by the terrible, quote, complexity of it all. Get over yourself. (sighs) That, the that terrible was complexity like, of it all. That was like lyrics from a slightly upgraded Mean Girls musical. <laughs> <laughs> okay, both sidesing genocide is beyond the pale. This is such trash. Why are you publishing normalizing garbage? So one of the uh, publishers, there were a number of publishers. So, so this is somebody named Madhuri Sastri. Her title was co-publisher. She says she's resigning from her position as co-publisher, and it you know has to do all with Palestine. So she gives she gives a screenshot of her resignation statement, and she says, "Free Palestine." I mean, a lot of this we should say this is an Israel Gaza issue at the moment. So, like, this kind of censoriousness is happening all the time. This particular case has to do with this particular issue, which is really inflamed right now, needless to say. But this has been going on for a long time. So, like, I'm wondering I know you don't follow it and you're not like on, you know, hearing all the gossip all the time, but like, how are you feeling just about the state of the arts right now? You know, I've been one of the most banned American authors, my young adult novel, The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian, since its publication in 2007. So for 17 years now, I've been in the top 10 of most banned books. And the tactics and philosophies and public statements of the far right are now being echoed almost verbatim by the far left. It's always about the language of harm and the children and the children. So it's hard for me to even distinguish now between the actions that the horseshoe theory coming painfully true about the far left and the far right becoming the same people. And that's what it feels like to me with what happened with this Guernica and with, I mean, how many other examples we could name of magazines retracting things they'd already published. And censorship has become multi-partisan in the United States, and writers have turned into censors. Uh, I keep thinking of Hollywood when, <laughs> you know, Kazan name names, and a lot of leftist progressive writers are naming names. And the only thing I ever think is at some point, I think some of them are going to be ashamed of themselves. Yeah. I mean, we do see it sometimes. I mean, because they get, it's a circular firing squad, right? So the cancelers tend to be first in line for getting canceled because you can only be canceled by your own side. I mean, that's what's different about this because, you know, the banned books thing, when artists were being censored by right-wing conservatives, 
you know, it was irritating, but it didn't have the sort of devastating effect because they're not your allies. Like we knew artists already considered those people their their enemies. But when it's coming from your own side, it's just incredibly discombobulating. I want to talk about The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian. So this is your, it's a semi-autobiographical young adult novel. This won the National Book Award for Young People's Literature, won a whole bunch of other awards. Huge, huge, huge book, sold millions of copies. Why was it banned in the first place? There's a lot of dick jokes. Okay. <laughs> That's really the, the basic reason for banning it is because there are dick jokes that... Okay. And it was a young adult novel. Yeah. The teenage boy narrator and his boy best friends tell five or six different dick jokes during the course of the novel. Because as we all know, it's only teenage Democrats who tell dick jokes. And... <laughs> <laughs> and and also over there's there's a joke uh, there's a cartoon for those of you who don't know the book the the narrator Arnold Spirit is a cartoonist and he draws one cartoon where Jesus is walking on water and the disciples are on the shore laughing like crazy because Jesus is farting and burping in harmony and so that gets called blasphemous and anti-christian and a new one came up. I still can't figure out why they got this specific. They called it anti-Catholic, which would be news to my wife that I'm anti-Catholic and my dad and the seven or eight Jesuit priests I hang around. Yeah, every okay. Indian has seven or eight Jesuit priest friends. That's how, <laughs> that's how it works. <laughs> right. They're still trying to fix us. <laughs> right. So, I mean, that, that's wrapped up in there. And the idea that I was harming children or presenting them was something they had never associated with. And I think it also has to do simply with the power of books, that books still retain power. I mean, we have parents trying to ban my book and they let their kids run around with those little demon boxes that hold all the horrible news about the world that's ever existed. So they're not afraid of the phones. They're afraid of the books. Mm -hmm. Well, what was it like when that book began to be classified as a problem? Like, did you, I mean, this was 2007, it came out. I mean, you were already pretty well established, I believe. Were you like worried? Like, was your publisher worried? Was this considered a crisis? No, uh, because it's simply, I mean, it would, it really was only in the news occasionally when it would happen. And there was no national organized effort. There was no national groups doing this, like Moms for Liberty. So it was individual instances. So it didn't feel as powerful. So it was far more amusing. I remember a parent in New Jersey, I think it was, who described the book as Fifty Shades of Grey for Teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> which put I, that on the cover as a blurb. Exactly. Talk about a blurb. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then there was a, a North Carolina, or maybe a South Carolina, where it talked about that the book contained blowjob lessons, which it lessons. does not. Yeah, lessons. Uh, so the book has slowly built the mythology over the years as well that it is this sex-filled romp, and, and it's not. Nobody has sex in the book. There are no sexual acts in the book. There are no sexual acts even described. It's dick jokes. So, <laughs> so it's all, it's, it's funny. It was funny mostly, and it helps sales here and there, and band book week, I'd sell a bunch of copies. But over the last five years or so, the conservative efforts to ban books have nationalized. So there's far more of the efforts to do it. And my book is a sort of a classic of being banned. But in the last few years, books about trans kids and, and gay kids, those books are getting heavily banned as well. So mine ends up being grouped with that. It, it's like this, I'm like this old man of getting banned <laughs> hanging around all these young kids of getting banned. <laughs> okay. Let's think about that a little harder. That could, I can see that as being, you know, 
kind of a puppet reenactment of this <laughs> dynamic here. Okay. Yeah, and but the left has, you know, come after True Diary a few times as well in British Columbia. It was one of four books that were removed from the recommended list and are not able to be taught unless they get approval. But you have to get approval from the people who pulled it from the recommended list. So it was a very soft banning. <laughs> yeah, we didn't ban the book. We just made it impossible to teach. And, and what what's the reason? It's what did the leftist have a the problem? The two with? words they used now, you know, I don't know who did it exactly, but the two words that were used in the press release were harm and trauma, which makes it pretty clear, I think, that the left in that community is responsible for the banning. It was to kill a mockingbird of mice and men and true diary. Wow. Okay. So when you were like growing up and reading things and presumably writing and drawing and, you know, being a creative young person. Did you ever think that we would get to a point in the culture? Like, did you imagine, you know, the, the life of an artist and the work of a creative person as sort of the ultimate free expression kind of job? Like, as I have to say, like I say this many times, like I got into this business because this is where the interesting ideas were. And these were where the surprising thinkers were. Like, these were the people I wanted to hang around with. And over the last 10 years, there's been a complete reversal. So how has that kind of panned out for you? Well, it breaks the heart of that little boy I was. You know, as you were asking the question, my mind immediately went back to books I read as a kid that were so new and shocking and just opened up the world to me and ideas. I immediately thought of the beginning of Stephen King's Carrie. Mm. And the book and the movie opened up with Carrie having her first period in the shower, in the group shower, and her getting terrorized by all the other girls. And uh, you know, this was in the 1970s when I read it. I didn't know anything about anything. So t to be shocked and horrified by that scene, by the bullying, and and then as the novel goes on, this this young woman's telekinesis, this power she's finding, and and it felt so subversive and and s scary, and it was frightening in ways I had never been frightened. And could that book even be published now by a first time author? I'm trying to think of the reasons they would give. I mean... A man writing about a woman. That's true. Right? Right? Maybe some kind of gender essentialism. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, and, and even just sort of trauma in and of itself. I mean, you... And you've talked about this before. I mean, you had a lot of trauma when you were growing up. You grew up on a reservation. There was incredible poverty. There was all kinds of really hard things happening. And you have integrated that into your work and a lot of things you talk about, you dealt with mental illness. I mean, as somebody who grew up with real trauma, like how do you even begin to deal with the way that word is used now? Oh, <laughs> it, it's, it's such, well, it's cosplay. I mean, we, yeah. we might as well be at the comic con of mental illness and <laughs> social oppression. Because it's that same way. There should be photos of, of, you know, people dressed up as poor people or dressed up as bipolar. You know, they have two masks <laughs> on. And I mean, I certainly write about it and I talk about it in public. But, you know, I think it's Mills Baker on Substack who wrote, <laughs> and he's bipolar and, and he wrote, he was pretty, pretty, pretty clear statement. He said, you know, uh, you don't really get to call yourself bipolar unless you've really fucked up your life. Mm -hmm. So I think trauma has just become another form of capitalist advertisement for careers. It's another line on the resume. And, you know, what really gets me mad when they do it is other Native Americans. You know, there have been things I know about, for instance, where a short story written by a non-Indian about an Indian character. They had it farmed out to a sensitivity reader, a Native American sensitivity reader who 
who wrote back and said that I couldn't get past the first sentence because I was so traumatized. And, <laughs> and I thought, oh, that person has never, ever once spent a night on any reservation. <laughs> you know, I, I can't, I mean, it, it hugely offends me that any Native American writer would claim to be offended by a sentence. Yeah, plus, I mean, if your job is sensitivity reader, I mean, I guess <laughs> I'm either you're either you're tailor made for that job or it's totally the wrong job for you. I can't quite decide. Like, you know, you should either be able to get through the get through the content and make a decision, or I guess if you know if you are immediately triggered and you can't go any further, then you are excellent at your job, and that's the end of that. I'm not sure. Well, yeah. Well, their job is to say no. <laughs> They're they're the uh, advanced scouts. <laughs> you know, you send them out there to look for the enemy, and then you send the editor in to quash that book. And that goes back to what you were saying earlier, too, about being censored by your own side, that the right wing comes for the books after they're published. Yeah. The left wing, because they are publishing, can get books canceled or not reviewed or disappeared or vanished. I, I think of that the book by the Asian young adult writer, I can't think of her name right now. Her book was lauded everywhere and great reviews everywhere. And then somebody read into it. There were slaves in the book. And this group of people decided that she was writing about African-American slavery. So she was culturally appropriating American slavery in this fantasy novel written by an Asian person who comes from a culture with a longer history of slavery. Right. This is Emily Wen Zhao, I believe is the author's yes. name. Blood Air. And, yeah. Yes. Yes. Is the book. And <laughs> I mean, it's an inverted form of cultural appropriation to claim that somebody writing about their culture's uh, fictional take on their culture's history of slavery somehow appropriates your own culture's history of slavery. And they destroyed that book. I mean, it eventually got published, but that book was going to be a launch. And they killed it. And a right-wing group could never do that. Oh, I mean, it would be good for the book if a right-wing group tried to do that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I try to make this argument all the time. It's so like the right wing can go after the books after they're already published. The, the left wing goes after them not only in the form of not platforming them, refusing to review, this kind of thing, but by not publishing them in the first place, right? Because the publishers themselves are progressive institutions. So and they don't even they ha they don't even have any chance out of the gate. That is a form of censorship right there, arguably. Well, yeah, my analogy is that the right wing are censorship Vikings and the left wing are censorship ninjas. <laughs> All right, so explain that a little more. <laughs> left wing sneaks in there and you don't even see them do it. All you see afterward are the bodies. And <laughs> the Vikings come in and set fire to everything. Oh, I and see. And heads are on pikes. I want to talk about what happened to you. I know, so you're going to be teaching a class uh, for the Unspeakeasy School of Thought, which is our new course wing of the Unspeakeasy. We are trying this out, and I'm like so delighted that you're going to teach this class for us. The, the reason I got this idea was that I have had a couple of students in my own workshops who had stuff happen to them, either social exile or professional cancellation, and they were trying to write about it and trying to figure it out. And it's really hard to get right. It's really easy to descend into self-pity, to get too deep in the weeds. And then, then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and this happened. And it's really not necessary. And it dawned on me one day in the middle of class that this should be an entirely separate course. So uh, you have been uh, kind enough to, to agree to teach this. And we're not going to talk about the details of your actual cancellation what happened and in fact it's that the details remain totally vague as far as i can see but but let's talk about what was the fallout professionally i mean i know you and i have talked about this offline but you were this was i believe in 2018 and you were like pretty much on the top of your game at that time uh <laughs> well i'll talk about the 
professional repercussions. Yeah. I can do that. And uh, the instant loss of millions of dollars in deals, the loss of opportunities for speaking gigs, for publication, the loss of some professional colleagues, only a few, but they still hurt. Most people stayed with me. Almost everybody stayed with me. And I simply can't get published right now. Okay. When you say the loss of millions of dollars, what does that mean? (laughs) Deals were in place. Like book deals, screenwriting deals? Um, Movie deals. Okay. Okay. And this all happened in the course of a week, did you say? Uh, It was about a month. A month. And, you know, it's tough to talk about this without going into the kind of detail I don't want to go into. Yeah. You know, I accept my place in the world as it is. Some of the weird things are the ways in which not just the way my career is in suspended animation in many ways, but also that the effort to erase me from history. You know, some of the new native writers who were doing very well were my students. <laughs> and to read about these, and the ones who are, there's also quite a few of them who weren't my students, but to read about the coverage of them, it's amazing to read a review of a book by a Native American that contains a basketball story, for instance, without talking about the Indian guy who sort of invented writing about basketball, Indian basketball, me. (laughs) The idea that, I mean, the cover of my first book, there's a basketball hoop on it. Uh, The first story in my first poetry collection is a basketball story, prose poem. So it's been that kind of thing happening where my influence has been disappeared. I mean, with Reservation Dogs, that great, great show, it's been amazing to watch the publicity and the critical reviews of it without ever mentioning smoke signals. Yeah, I wondered about that. Can you just describe, I know that was a collection of uh, short stories that was made into a film in the late 90s, I think. Can you explain what Smoke Signals was about? Yeah, Smoke Signals is a film based on my book of short stories. The Lone Ranger and Tonto Fistfight in Heaven. And we made the film independently with a a group in Seattle here called Shadow Catcher. We sold the film to Miramax. Miramax released it in the summer of 1998. It did extremely well. It remains the only feature film written, directed, and co-produced by Native Americans to ever receive a national distribution deal. And an international distribution deal. It played in over 800 theaters at one point. It was a major release. It made over $12 million in today's money, which would make it a massive hit in today's movie economy. It won the Audience Award and the Filmmaker's Trophy at Sundance. It's still a huge part of Native American culture. Huge part of Native American culture. Smoke signals and memes are never ending. Never ending. I, I have hundreds of them in my files that people have sent me or I've discovered online. So it's it's a it's a massive cultural artifact. Uh, Evan Adams, who plays one of the major characters, the actor, he, he once said that playing Thomas Builds the Fire was like playing Scarlett O'Hara. <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of cultural power this movie has. Yeah, and to not mention it that this hilarious reservation story, subversive, uh, ironic, magical realism isn't part of the discussion, that's very purposeful. Yeah. Okay. Like, what is the original source of this kind of behavior? I mean, so much, uh, you know, okay. But, and by behavior, I'm, you know, just saying this sort of like weaponized trauma, you know, wanting to just get, you know, f- fighting by stabbing people in the back. It's it's a kind of uh, warfare that is enabled by social media. You know, I would say it's sort of like instead of fighting with, you know, your fists, people do reputational damage. 
and this is something I talk about on my other podcast with Sarah Hader all the time, like this is a kind of way that women fight often. It's reputational damage, not that men don't participate as well. But like there's a lot of talk about social media really being the defining factor. Do you think it's that simple? I think social media create was the perfect outlet for who we were anyway. When you're talking about writers, you're talking about an incredibly narcissistic and vulnerable group of people. <laughs> a vulnerable population? Yes. Writers? Writers. And, <laughs> you know, I don't have a lot of close writer friends. And that's very much on purpose. And the kind of writer friends I have, by and large, are people who came from small towns you know, my writer friends are almost all public school <laughs> kids. So there's also the idea that I think the writing world has become more and more elite. It's certainly far more crowded with the elite than it was when I started publishing, especially in the small press world. I started publishing in these magazines called things like tray full of lab mice and giants play well in the drizzle and you know these great little magazines that people staple together at their kitchen tables oh zines actually Z zines but yes. that's what poetry mags were though i mean that's right. what the small press world was people doing this by hand and you know you look I, I looked at them recently because i was moving stuff around and i was looking at the job the bios of the writers in there. You know, we we're talking, there was a lot more blue collar people. There was a lot of people with real jobs. And now you look at, you know, Guernica or Hobart or many of these small press journals whose lives are almost entirely lived online. And you look at the bios and they have all the same MFA degrees from as every writer in the Paris Review or the New Yorker. The bios are exactly the same. Yeah. So, and is there anybody more cutthroat than somebody trying to get into an elite college and then trying to leverage that elite education into an elite job? You know, they say Washington, D.C. is Hollywood, but ugly. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I would say <laughs> the book world is Wall Street, except mid-list. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, except poor, or let's say <laughs> Wall Street, except bad at math, <laughs> bad with numbers. I became a writer because I didn't want to belong. And I think the reason why I ended up with the career I have is because I never really fit anywhere. And I was always in trouble for something or another. And now, the rebellion against the first half of my career, people are rebelling against that now. So these so-called progressive writers have become incredibly reactionary and group thought. And now I'm wondering if maybe there's all these 13, 14, and 15-year-olds who are going to become writers who utterly rebel against what's happening now. Will they rise up and take back the small press world and they take back publishing and they rebel against the MFA and they rebel against AWP and they rebel against all the literary mafias out there. And, you know, maybe there is a Sylvia Plath or Dorothy Parker or Toni Morrison or, or somebody genuinely revolutionary is on the way. Maybe there's four of them and they'll change everything. We once lived in a world where Beloved was a number one New York Times bestseller. Yeah. We lived in a world where Tom Wolfe was a, a massive cultural figure. <laughs> so. Well, and Philip Roth and, and Cheever and Updike and Nabokov and Franzen and Latham and even, even a few women <laughs> every now and then. Yeah. And once in a while. Uh, maybe, I'm, maybe, and see, again, I get worried that I sound like a, a 
like I'm in a nursing home. And I guess in a way I am, but... I can't wait for the nursing home because think of the books that they're going to have and also think of the uh, <laughs> entertainment that's going to come through. I had this whole idea. It was because it was, it's called Gen X Hospice Dinner Theater. And uh, I, I'm not, I'm still working it out, but it's going to be good. <laughs> and... Well, well, I mean, for instance, I look at something like Esquire, which used to be yes. a major place to get your fiction published. Right. And they still do, but... They have fiction still? Once in a great while. Okay. And But it, it used to be... I mean, my very first published short story was in Esquire. Oh, wow. Uh, and it yeah, started big. And uh, just the notion of big masculine magazine publishing fiction. Yeah. A mainstream place that was unapologetic about the fact that you can really obsess over the color of your belt while also thinking about Mailer versus Gore Vidal. Right, right. But that required conflict and anger and all the emotions. And... Today's literary culture is not interested in arguing. It's, it's not interested in being bold. It's not interested in... I mean, there's great books being written. There's books I've really enjoyed by new writers. But none of them really challenged any other writer. You mean any other writer from the past? Of the present. Oh, well, when you say none of them really challenged, and I, actually, if you want to, I, I feel like I'm sure listeners are going to be frustrated with this whole conversation because we're not actually naming any names for for, <laughs> for various obvious reasons. But take our word for it; you're going to imagine who we're talking about. No, but so, but I mean, if there's anybody that you've read lately that you that you truly enjoyed, I would love to know. You should tell us. <laughs> well, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, <laughs> but he's on Substack, and his book is called Victim, and his name is Andrew Boyaga. Okay. And and it got a great review in the New York Times. And it's a book. It is akin to American fiction, the movie, which is based on Percival Everett's novel, Erasure. And Victim is essentially the story of how this brown writer has created this massive literary career based on subtle and not so subtle exaggerations and lies about his underprivileged background, about his trauma. So the novel is essentially about everything we're talking about, and it's getting great reviews. So maybe that's a watershed book. I had talked to him very early on, maybe when he first started his Substack, he and I interacted. And, and I told him, I think your book might be coming out at the exact right time for you. And so there's a novel I think is very much worth reading. And it's a book that's interrogating the moment it's interrogating other writers. It's interrogating the expected politics and philosophy and sociology of current literary writers. It's challenging the dominant mode of expression. It's challenging the zeitgeist of the oatmeal sweater-wearing writers of the world. Yeah, that's definitely on my list. And American fiction does the same thing we should say. Although, you know, the thing is that in both of these examples, those are writers of color. Like, do you think that writers of color are able to get away with this in ways that white writers would not be? Yeah, because I have seen a little of the talk going, there's a little of the, oh, yes, you know, I can laugh at myself. It's it's like being a totalitarian with a sense of humor. That's some of the <laughs> reaction to American fiction I've read. Oh, yes, you know, this is satire. No, it's a lot more than that. <laughs> it's not just satire. It's an actual mirror. Well, here we go. I think a lot of the reaction to it, people think they're looking at a window and don't realize they're looking at a mirror. I think of the novel and the movie especially because I, I haven't read the novel in a long time, but I think of the scenes with the award panels. Oh my God, that was amazing. And I, I'm sure you've been on award panels and I've yes, been we're on talking about award panels. We're talking about judges. So people who are judging yeah. uh, literary contests. And yeah, <laughs> they had the four kind of types, the usual suspects, they each were represented on this jury panel. Yeah, I have names. For all four writers. 
<laughs> okay. Well, I we should say him. there were. If, okay, so there's like the Brooklyn. So there's the woman, the kind of Brooklyn, like Park Slope, typical writer. There's the kind of there's the there's the Raymond Carver wannabe kind of uh, you know like lives out on a ranch somewhere, uh, yeah, yeah. drinking <laughs> the, a lot. The guy white with guy. Montana, land in Montana. Yes, exactly. And uh, who are the other ones? Let's see. The elite black woman writing about poor black people. Yes, exactly. Yes. Oh, and who was having a huge year. Yeah, she was kind of the flavor of the year. Uh, yes. Her literary career. So she, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, and then I guess our, our hero. So it was the four of them. It was the main, then, the, then there was the main character. And I think, I, yes. So, so I, I've been on a few of those judging panels for major awards and they certainly captured an element of that and but in some ways the satire the humor lets people off the hook because you're just in the room and you don't see the ways in which i think those juries what happens is far more insidious than the novel portrays it well cuz it's really affecting people's careers and also you're seeing it through the eyes of this of this main character the, the who was the the narrator in the novel and and the main character in the movie who's like an incredibly charismatic you know performance a very charismatic character and actor and it's kind of being it's it's filtered so you're not actually just seeing the stark reality of this nonsense yeah i i, I mean i'm thinking of one story in particular and I, i'm going to be generic yet again sorry audience but I know of from firsthand testimony of a panel for a big award where one book was going to win it, but one juror refused and threatened to blow up the entire panel. And they had the kind of influence of power in the book world where their threats were taken very seriously. Wait, what do you mean blow up? What do you mean? What do you mean? Blow up the blow up their other people's careers to make it into. Then this was before this era where curious could be destroyed by somebody making complaints. But this was somebody who was going to threaten to make accusations of various isms toward the other of, jurors of each person on the panel. Like like you, I'm going to do this. You, I'm going to do that. Really? Yes. And so this person essentially declared war, threatened war. And so the compromise is that it ended up being the second, the book that by consensus was the second best book that won the uh, award. Wow. And and that's not, and the thing is, that book uh -huh. is great. <laughs> there, there's no arguing against the quality of the book that won. But there was another book that should have won, and that person did not get the laurel that the panel actually wanted to bestow on them. And it was based on one person's domination of the panel. And was this person having like a personal vendetta with the author, or did they just truly think it was not, it did not merit the award on a literary basis? It did not merit the award for all sorts of reasons. Huh. Okay. I'm imagining what this might be. And I've been on panels where there was low-key nepotism. I, I've been on panels where people didn't disclose relationships the rest of us knew they had with certain writers. I mean, for your listeners, just think about every meeting you've ever had in your job. <laughs> Think about your workplace and all the favoritism and politics and all that's going on in your workplace. And it happens in our workplace. And there are great writers whose careers haven't even had a chance to begin or whose careers have been destroyed or whose careers are in suspended animation based on Everything except the quality of the literature itself. Yeah. Well, before we wrap up, and actually, I'm I'm going to. I, I realize I'm. I've asked you a couple of questions out of order, so I might just move some sections around here. So don't be alarmed if this sounds like it's out of left field. But I'm going to put it earlier. Okay. I want to ask you about 
what you've written and talked about as far as your mental health struggles. I know you have said that you have a diagnosis of bipolar. I know you've also said that you don't like that term, that you prefer manic depression. And, you know, I feel like everyone is saying they're bipolar these days. Not everyone, many people, especially writers (laughs) for some reason, maybe writing causes by bipolar. (laughs) I don't know. But if you, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. I know that especially um, after the election in 2016, you went into a real manic phase and did some rather remarkable things. So what can you tell us about that? (laughs) Well, I prefer manic depression because it describes the symptoms. Uh, It's mania and depression. And and bipolar sounds geographic. (laughs) And it doesn't really describe what happens. It doesn't describe the sheer, the extremes it comes no in fact it it's almost the opposite bipolar makes it sound sort of yes. peaceful yes yes <laughs> and it's not it it's horrendous and you know various people have written about the phenomenon but certainly the the self diagnosis craze of mental illness on social media and elsewhere is 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 an epidemic unto itself and declaring yourself to be bipolar is a big thing and i've watched a few of them and they're describing how they feel and i'm no healthcare professional but it's pretty clear what they're describing is ordinary sadness <laughs> and and ordinary attention deficit disorder Yeah. And mania and depression in bipolar terms are so intense that you could not get on social media and talk about them as being a gift. Yeah, I guess people do use that term. Yes. Yes. As if it makes them superhuman. (laughs) And, and, I mean, my joke is I would give up 51% of everything I've ever written not to be bipolar. (laughs) And I mean, among the many stupid and self-destructive and destructive things I've done because of being depressed or manic, one of the most, in in the fall of 2006, I, I was in a manic period that probably was two years. From the period of my mother's death through brain surgery I had that same year into the 2016 political campaign. And at the same time, I was writing the memoir about my mother. And I entered into a manic phase where I ended up buying about $10,000 worth of emergency food and supplies because I thought the apocalypse was coming. And I also bought the best civilian bulletproof vest you can get. I I could have been shot by most rifles in the world and survived when wearing that vest. Okay, was this because of the election or was this just kind of um, ambient dystopia? I was already in mania when that heated up. So all of my paranoid, manic hallucinations about the world were coming true. Oh, I see. So you were right. Uh, Yes, okay. Uh, which is the worst thing possible for a mentally ill person to be right. (laughs) And uh, I think about, uh, (laughs) that just made me think about that scene in broadcast news where William Hurt says to Albert Brooks, what do you do when your reality exceeds your dreams? And Albert Brooks says, you keep quiet about it. (laughs) So when the bipolar person says, what do you do when reality exceeds your most twisted paranoias you buy a bulletproof vest wow wow so like where was your family with all of this were they going along with it How, what was your household like no no trap and my friends my family everybody are they were <sighs> yeah i mean when you see people online talk about their mental illness and and diagnosing themselves and you don't see their friends or family talking about it. You know, you don't get any indication of how much, not only that they've hurt themselves, but how much they've hurt the people around them. You know, my mental illness 
wrecked people around me. I was driving the school bus and all my family and friends were on there with no seatbelts. Figuratively. And. Okay. Just yes. Clear. It, it's, it's, it's horrendous. And, and, and even when you get healthy, the side effects of the meds, the weight gain, the night sweats, the dry mouth, this, this medicine that, it, it, you know, it's like, it's like mental health chemotherapy that it partially kills you to save you. And then you end up making this, and then you hope the medicines keep working. And then you have to adjust the dosages all the time. And all it does is it, it shuts the door to the attic of mania and it shuts the door to the basement of depression, but, but you're still mentally ill. I'm still mentally ill and it's not going away. It's a terminal disease. And I'm so much better at dealing with it. You know, I've done therapy. I'm on medication. I, I've altered my lifestyle in positive ways, but it's still there. And when I get off this podcast, I have to go deal with it. When I'm not writing, I have to deal with it. No matter how publicly honest I am or how honest I ever appear to be about it, the private suffering is awful. And I'm not nearly as ill as many of the bipolar people who are in my circle now. Freddie DeBoer talks about this on his Substack. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He has a great Substack. He talks about the the gentrification yes. of mental illness. Which, which is yeah. a great term. Yeah. And I, and I would also, I would call it the colonization. Yes. Yes, it's, it's, um, it should be. All, all these people are colonizers. Yeah. When are all the uh, kind of uh, the uh, bipolar trenders going to get scolded for being colonizers? Well, the thing is, the people who use that terminology, decolonize, decolonize, what they really mean is don't steal my shit, but yours is free. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Did you write? Uh, and there are writers. It's so funny when writers talk about decol. There's nobody more colonial. There's nobody. There's no pathological shoplifters. Writers. Man, we are such vampires. Just ask the family members and friends of every writer in the world. <laughs> ask I the know. ex husbands and wives and ex romantic partners about who we are. Oh gosh. Oh, I wanted to ask you about that. Okay, before we segue into that, and then I'm gonna let you go. Like, were you a better writer when you were manic or when you are in those phases? Do you write more? Is that your productive time? I used to, <laughs> I mean, I was trapped up in that illusion that. I was a better writer, but also part of mania is the delusion that you're superhuman. And I would be really productive when I was manic, but that's only, there's a, there's, there's a time limit on it. There's, so I would, I would be awake for two or three days in a row writing. You know, friends would wake up at seven in the morning and I would have sent them 25 poems <laughs> that I'd written that night. Were they any good? <laughs> you know, I... I some, you know, I wrote Flight, the novel, in a week. Yeah, and I wrote it while I was writing True Diary of a Part-Time Indian. So I was writing two books at the same time, and I finished one of them in a week. And so, yes, things were published. Things were great. But I was destroying my health, and I was behaving in ways that were really destructive, the thing where the mania really made its presence known is on stage performance. Now, I am a performer. I'm a comedian and a monologue dude. I'm some combination of Jonathan Franzen, Jerry Seinfeld, Richard Pryor, and Spalding Gray. I'm some combo of that on stage. And I was always improvising on stage. And on those, the most manic nights when i was most <laughs> delusional and 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 grandiose were some of my very best performances hmm it's funny how that is well you said before that writers are all vampires ask anyone who's lived with us or even known us or is related to us i mean this is something i struggle with a lot. And, you know, one thing I've been saying to students more often is like, 
you know, if you write something that is hurtful to somebody, you know, despite all the pains maybe you take to make it as 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 unhurtful as possible, it's still going to hurt them. But it's a really, really great story or it's a really great essay and it becomes worth it on a literary level, even if it's not worth it on a personal level. How do you deal with that? Yeah, then you have to make the choice. This has me thinking of my Navajo writing students that I've had in the past. There is no other tribe that has retained more of their culture and worldview than the Navajo. They are the tribe, partly because there's so many of them. They just have more of them. They have more of a quorum of people available to keep the culture alive. And there's so many secrets to keep inside their culture. So many Edith Wharton social rules. And as writers, they struggle with that, that in order to write their best, they have to break some social rules. And I've had Navajo students who just couldn't do it, and they stopped writing. There were very talented writers who couldn't break the rules. And my advice to them when they were my students was always, well, you have to ignore the social rules when you're writing. And then when you think about publishing, then you have to make the choice. Yeah, I always say, you know, if you've written something and somebody wants to publish it and you're worried about it, that's a better problem to have than not being able to write it in the first place because you're worried. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there are a few things that I won't republish because of conversations I've had with people. Do you show friends and family members your work before you publish it if it has anything to do with them? Well, with my memoir, which was about primarily about my relationship with my mother, but my siblings and my dad are in there, of course. When I was writing it, I was communicating with my sisters constantly to get their view and opinion about similar events. So they operate as something of a Greek chorus in the memoir. And when our memories contradicted or when they remembered something I didn't, I, I would include things like that. So I use them to keep me honest. And my mother's sister, our aunt, who was still alive then when the book came out, was really once railing against me in the book to my sisters. And how could I do this? How could I do this? And my sister said to my aunt, well, you didn't live with us. You don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so my siblings have always defended my work, even when it was something that might have been painful to them. So I'm very lucky, very lucky. But I certainly don't write about certain things now because I don't think I have the right. And part of that for me is also from culture. You know, inside tribal traditions, inside my tribe, you don't tell somebody else's traditional story or sing somebody else's traditional song unless you have express permission. And I don't write a whole lot about religion or spirituality because that stuff is sold wholesale for white audiences. Uh, I think a lot of Native American writers do sell themselves. They're sort of a Buffalo Bill Wild West show when it comes to Native literature, and you have to be very careful that you don't turn yourself into a wooden Indian. Well, you're going to be teaching a class for us. Like I said at the beginning, this is, um, I, I really would be surprised if anybody has offered a class in writing your cancellation story. If anybody has, they can come uh, after me for for appropriation. But <laughs> I, again, I think this is, it's such an interesting thing because, you know, when we think about cancellation, we often think about sort of these big grand scale public figures being canceled. But the fact is, is this dynamic happens all the time, even in very small ways. People can lose friends or they can get thrown out of their book club or they can, you know, get thrown kind of, you know, driven out of their MFA program. I mean, I hear that story again and again. And part of the reason that I'm offering these courses under the the unspeakeasy school of thought is that, you know, we have this whole heterodox kind of sphere now when it comes to like, you know, there's all kinds of, you know, institutions and initiatives coming up to 
you know, foster free speech in the classroom, but it hasn't really touched the arts yet. There's not like a free speech MFA program or anything. And this is not that, obviously, but I am very curious to see uh, what comes of this. So you're going to be teaching a class and and people, you know, writing out these stories and and trying to make sense of them. Is is there anything we should know about your your teaching style or uh, anything anyone should be afraid of? (laughs) Well, I'm certainly going to approach the workshop as I would approach any 12-step meeting. And what, what is said in the meeting stays in the meeting. I think it's a very private and serious endeavor. And I want to have as few rules as possible. There's going to be structure, of course. I'm immediately going to have to make it clear that everything is permissible inside the work. Yes, that's exactly on brand for us. (laughs) Everything (laughs) that happens in the unspeakeasy stays in the unspeakeasy. And, you know, the people that are drawn to us are people who want to have those conversations. And they're not going to go crazy over some detail that makes them uncomfortable. In fact, that's what they're there for. We're there to get rowdy with each other and to disagree and to argue and to say and write inappropriate things. And and will it be cathartic? I hope so. But my greatest hope is that at least one person writes something great something that will get out into the world and really, really affect culture. Okay, now you're putting a lot of pressure on people. Well, I said I hope. Uh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I mean, wh- why would we do a workshop without that hope? No, you're right. You're right. And, you no. know, I helped create the low residency MFA at the Institute of American Indian Art. Art. I was a founding professor and it got quick accreditation because I was associated with it. And I did it because I thought there were native writers out there who had great books and that this would help them. And it did. Great books have been published by those writers. And then also it was a way to help people tell their story, regardless of whether they're going to be published or not. Because even if you don't aim to ever get something published, you still need a great teacher, a great editor to make it the best possible distillation of your ideas, even if you're the only one who's ever going to read it. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think people really appreciate that. There's a lot of, it's it's all too easy to kind of just write your stuff and uh, throw it out there on the interweb, but to have a great teacher is an incredible gift. So you're about to have some very lucky students and um, I can't thank you enough. I can't thank you enough for doing it and, and moreover for having not only this conversation, but just such a profound impact on on me and so many other writers and readers. You're really just spectacular author and thinker and person. So I'm really grateful. Thank you. Well, as I keep saying, as I'm sure you keep saying, the culture is going to change when more and more people make brave decisions. And you've made one. Okay. There's a fine line between uh, brave and clever and stupid, as uh, I believe Nigel Tufnell said. (laughs) So... Okay. If you have to ask, uh, you know the answer. Okay. Well, Sherman, uh, thank you so much. And I hope we'll talk again. Thank you, Megan. That was my conversation with novelist, short story writer, poet, screenwriter, filmmaker, spoken word artist, Sherman Alexi. And uh, before I tell you uh, more about Sherman, just so you know, I misquoted from Spinal Tap at the end there. There's a fine line between clever and stupid. There was a David St. Hubbins quote, not Nigel Tufnell, because I know you were running to your computers about to set me straight. Okay. Anyway, Sherman, you can find his Substack at shermanalexi.substack.com where he is extremely prolific. Sherman's workshop for the Unspeakeasy School of Thought runs six consecutive Tuesdays, April 16th through May 21st on Zoom. And you can find out how to apply by going to theunspeakeasy.com and pulling down the menu under School of Thought. We are also offering workshops in fiction and screenwriting, by the way. And I'm getting tons of requests for more subjects. So stay tuned. I'll be back next week with another super nuanced guest. Thanks for listening. See you then.